You're listening to Chapter Approved with your loyal host, Tibbs. And today, I'm extremely excited to bring you the first part of my interview with Mr. Pink from Modern Synthesis fame. Now, before I get into the interview, I do want to mention briefly that we'll be talking rather in-depth about a few of his projects. So if you're not familiar with his work, I would suggest uh, if you're sitting at your desk or by a computer, uh, you can go and take a look at his website at modernsynthesist.com. Or you can take a look at his Twitter and Instagram feeds. You can find him on Twitter at mod underscore synth. Or on Instagram at just modern synthesis. Uh, that way, at least you'll understand some of what we're talking about. We primarily in this first episode, we'll talk about his dark Eldar creations. So if you're not familiar with them, again, I really strongly suggest you take a look because... Some of the things that we'll be talking about are almost impossible to describe. But if you have seen a little bit of his work, I think it'll really make uh, some of our conversation a lot more fruitful. So without further ado, I'll jump right into the first part of the interview. And at the end of the episode, I'll lead us out as well. But uh, sit back, enjoy the ride. It's a really fun conversation. I think you're going to like it. Uh, my guest today is Mr. Pink of Modern Synthesis fame. Uh, first of all, is that what you actually want us to call you? Do you go by Mr. Pink? I do go by Mr. Pink, so that's probably okay. Perfect. All right. Is that a reference to Reservoir Dogs? Absolutely. I'm glad you caught that one. Okay. I've always actually wondered that about your name, so I'm glad I cleared that up. I think I first discovered his blog because of some sculpting tutorials that he's done that I recommend for basically everyone at any skill level. They range from the very basics to some pretty advanced techniques, and he has promised to put out more of them. Hint, hint. <laughs> so, yes, please please do so, sir. <laughs> Absolutely. But there are some very good tips in there, uh, especially if you're getting started. Um, he covers everything from the tools you'll need to uh, you know, practice tutorials you can do, things like that, so definitely worth checking out uh you know come for the models but stay for the learning basically um so i guess first things first uh i'm always curious how long people have been gaming or how they got into the hobby uh so i guess what's your origin story as it were sure um well before i get to that can i apologize for two things sure first of all um i'm dealing with some kind of cold thing so i'm sniffly that's all good don't worry about it (laughs) Secondly, I, I definitely want to apologize for choosing one of the most obscure names ever for my blog. Um, modern synthesis doesn't really roll off the tongue, but hopefully people still, you know, get out there, check it out. Yeah, these days people will probably type it in more than they'll actually say it out loud. So, <laughs> Yeah, exactly. As we just discovered. Right. So I wouldn't sweat it too much. <laughs> okay. um, yeah, so origin story. Um, I feel like I got started in the hobby a couple of times. Um, the first time I was ever introduced to the Games Workshop hobby was when I was a kid, probably about, um, I guess it would be like the third or fourth grade. I don't know what year that was, but it was around the time that they had those Rogue Trader multi-part beige plastic Space Marines, and there oh, yeah. were some pewter Harlequins kicking around. Oh, absolutely. I had a friend across the street whose older brother was into D&D, and he did all these amazing sketches for D&D. And then me and the little brother, we'd kind of like kick around and look at his stuff. But he got into Warhammer 40K somehow. Hmm. And his parents were artists. So his mom wound up painting his Harlequins, which was amazing. Oh, that's awesome. But I just remember that they had this amazing gaming table in their basement. And it was, all the scenery was built in. Like there were actual hills built into this thing and sewers and all kinds of stuff. And it wasn't movable terrain that just kind of skittered around on top. It was physically built into this table in a way that only parents who are artists can do for you, I guess. Um, And it just blew me away. And seeing these little space Marine dudes kicking around. um, Yeah, that was my first experience with it. And then I had a couple of other run-ins where like a friend got some orc models at a point and we tried to paint them. But then I got into it seriously um, in my first year of high school when I was trying to buy Ultramarines for my brother off a friend who was into this Warhammer 40K thing. And he said, well, actually. <laughs> you make it sound like a drug deal or something. Dude, is this not how you got into Warhammer 40K? Warhammer 40K was absolutely drug deals when we were kids. <laughs> you would listen. This guy was like, oh, yeah, I'm going to sell this to you for your brother. But, hey, 
have you heard about the Tiernids? <laughs> like, no, what are Tiernids? Like, come on over here, take a look at this case. And this guy opens this black suitcase and there's all these multi-limbed, multi-colored creatures in there. I'm like, wow, these are for me. And oddly enough, they were probably actually made of lead at that point. So they probably were toxic and illegal to sell. Yes, exactly. <laughs> but no, absolutely. Like I was. Don't tell your mom where you got these kid, but there's more where that came from. <laughs> yeah, I was absolutely drug dealed in a 40K. And I remember we drug dealed our friends in a 40K. It would be like, awesome. hey. So uh, we literally had a guy who started a space marine army. And then we were like, well, we've got Tyranids. We've got space marines. You know what we need? We need some Eldar. So we found a buddy of ours who got a lot of allowance. And basically showed like, hey, how about this? How do you like these guys? Oh, yeah, that's like a bloody-handed killer dude. And look at this big robot over here. And you got this grav tank. And it was absolutely like drug deals. We absolutely pushed our friends into 40K. That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, I guess I didn't have that experience because, you know, I just played with my older brothers. And we never really played with too many other people. So it's really cool to hear how it spread like that. I love it. Well, it's cool, but I also feel really guilty about it. But whatever i'm sure those guys are contributing members of society that have real jobs now <laughs> i don't i don't think you need to worry about it man don't don't let that yeah. hold you down from that uh introduction i have had a spotted history with the hobby where i was into it in high school and then i kind of like let it lapse then i got back into it in university and then i like let it lapse and then i got into it after university and then i let it lapse um so it was it was kind of weird but i remember I was into second edition Tyranids and then like the third edition codex came out and there was no Tyranid co or third edition rule book came out. There was no Tyranid codex yet, except for that weird codex Imperialis thing that gave you kind of like vanilla rules for all the armies. Um, that was a cool time because that was when gene stealers all had power weapons, but I wasn't really into it. Uh, I tried to get into dark Eldar then, but they didn't really pick, they didn't really grab my fancy. I don't even remember dark Eldar back then. I'm sure they were around. I really don't remember them. And Games Workshop did their job with that one where I went to the Games Workshop store in town. Um, a guy was assembling Dark Eldar and painting them. And I was like, these models are amazing. They're so, they're fantastic. I'm totally going to start collecting these guys. But the multi-part warriors were pretty much the best models at that time. And all the rest were not as great. Tried to get into Dark Eldar. Didn't work out. Um, and then it was until third edition Tyranid Codex came out. Um, that was when they had the new Plastic Gaunts, the new Plastic Warriors, um, and then I kind of got back into it and around that time was when I discovered a Yahoo group for Tyranids, mm -hmm. which was back in the day before like real forums and social media. Right. But that I think was the catalyst that really got me into the hobby in a big way. Cause there were a lot of people there doing conversions. There was a guy there who was sculpting his own stuff and like, it all seemed so foreign, but it was where I got my start. And then that Yahoo group got taken over by spam bots and porn bots. Oh God a really amazing member of that group named Michael Cassavant. He went by the name Phage. He started Warp Shadow just like out of his own pocket. He went, found out how to create a forum, set up the domain. He's like, hey, let's go over here. There's no porn bots. And that was really the beginning of me taking the hobby seriously because I don't know if anyone, like people are still familiar with Warp Shadow these days. It's not as active as it, as it once was, but um, in its heyday and like in Tyranid's heyday, it was insane. Like that was where Moloch happened and like, um, Hydra, if you know Hydra, and there was this other guy on there named Box, and these people were all just doing phenomenal conversions. Um, like, if you've ever heard of Troll Forge games, Ed Forte came out of the Yahoo group and, um, and Warp Shadow. Like, these people were converting Forge World models before people converted Forge World models. Um, back when, like, Forge World models were these precious things that you paid hundreds of dollars for and never right. touched. Right. Um, Hydra went in and bought a hair duel and then chopped it up and made a dominatrix out of it, and we all thought he was insane. And then he told us that we could do it too. And it was pretty cool. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. I've actually, you have a conversion like that on your site, right? Yeah. So he did, he did it originally. And then I did a version. I, I swore that I could never do that. And then um, a very, very, very amazing hobby friend of mine named Ross Nickel, who sadly is, um, he passed away a number of years ago. But he's like a human cheerleader that everyone should have one of these people who believes in you more than you believe in yourself. And I said to him, I'm like, I could never do that. He's like, what do you mean you can't do that? And he bought me a hair duel. I was like, here, do it for me. That's cool. So man. that was my first commission. Wow. Yeah. So that one wasn't that great. But then I did a second one for um, Malak, High Fleet Malak. And that one was much better than the first one. Um, but yeah, I think both of those are on the site. Yeah, that's awesome, man. Wow. What a cool story. Like just in general. It's... Yeah. So 
I feel like that was kind of like when I was most active in the hobby at that point. And then I kind of fell out of it again, just because of like life and I wasn't as into it. And um, that was kind of in the years when Games Workshop had a very adversarial relationship with their hobby community. And having grown up with like old school White Dwarf, where when I found that Tyranid community on Yahoo groups, it was actually because White Dwarf told me to go there. Like oh, wow. The kind of thing that you couldn't imagine for a number of years, Games Workshop promoting some community outside of their own community. Yeah. Um, but yeah. that was kind of like what I grew up with and like real White Dwarf, where they would give you like, like experimental rules. And here are the Tyranid ma- monstrous creature design rules where you can make your own crazy creations and that was what i loved about the hobby and then i kind of watched that part of the hobby die and it just seemed like it was price increase after price increase and yeah anyone who tried to do anything original was getting shut down and uh yeah so that put me off the hobby for a long time and then um i kind of got pulled back into it sometime around i don't know if it was fourth edition or fifth edition the new uh dark eldar codex came out mm-hmm. the new dark eldar line came out and it mm-hmm. was amazing mm-hmm and um somewhere in there i was really inspired by the homunculus stuff oh yeah and i was uh, active on a community both warp shadow and the dark city and i I met someone on warp shadow who i convinced to let me do a a homunculus coven for them like convert a couple squads of racks and grotesques and some raiders and it was it was really fortunate for me it was basically i wanted to do these cool conversions i didn't have the money to do it so I found someone who wanted to pay me the money to do it. So I didn't want to keep the models. I just wanted to do them. So I did it for this guy. Oh, and so that's that, okay. Because that's actually one of my favorite projects of yours. And that's, that's what my next question was going to be about was the homunculus coven. So you actually started doing those for a buddy and then you made your own after that. Cause you liked it or. Yeah. So yeah, like it was something where I saw the, the art in the codex and it really inspired me. And then I saw the, this was, I think, before they had even released the racks. I don't know if they'd released them yet. Because the racks and the the grotesque came out after the codex. Um, but there was art for them in the codex. Mm-hmm. And they came out in fine cast. So they weren't in plastic yet. Yep. And I was so blown away by the art. I'm like, hey, I can make those. And that's where I like came up with the idea of combining like flagellants and blood letters to make a rack model. Yeah, that was when Paulson Games, um, he created his own things that he called bioterrors. They were basically, mm-hmm. this is like chapter house days where, is that what it was called? Chapter house? Chapter house. Yeah. They were, they were the knockoff Marine guys, right? Yep. Exactly. Yeah. So this is like third parties creating conversion bits. Um, Paulson games was one of the third parties that kind of like created the conversion bits. He created a lot of Tau stuff. And then uh, he created this model called a bioterror, which was basically a grotesque with some modifications to it. Um, so I bought a bunch of those and I used them as basis to convert grotesques and then i made my custom racks for this guy and then i converted my first um dark eldar raider and i did those projects for him but it was a situation where i'd done a couple of conversion uh, commissions before but i didn't really know what to quote the guy and foolishly we didn't agree to a price up front so Ooh. it wound up <laughs> me being like hey i spent so much time on these things and made each one of them like a work of art as far as i'm concerned and it's going to cost you this much money. Right. You can't and afford like, it. Oh God. I wish we talked about this before. So fortunately he was still like, okay, I want the models. So we came to an agreement and I made him one squad of racks and one squad of grotesques. And we called it quits after that, but the bug was still in me. And yeah. I, I still really loved like my concepts for them. And by the time I kind of got midway through that commission or by the time I was finishing it, the, um, that was when the first models, uh, first fine cast models for the racks and the grotesque came out. Mm-hmm. And it was a pretty great compliment. Cause the guy who commissioned me, I'm like, Oh God, I'm sorry, man. Like I made you these models and now there's new models. And he said, well, I like your versions better. So that's fine. And I kind of liked my versions better as well. Um, so yeah, from that, I was just like, hey, I have these models. Um, I really like the ideas I had. Maybe I'm going to start making these for myself. That's pretty awesome. So I was going to ask you, you know, I think you already kind of answered it, but I was basically going to ask you where you came up with the idea for the army. But I mean, you, you explained it all pretty well, but I do want to point out to the listeners that you documented this whole process really, really well uh, on your blog. And I think if you're not familiar with it, you know, for the listeners out there, I think you should really check out his armies on parade board. Um, 
this thing is insane. I, I can try to describe it, but it's not going to be good radio. Essentially, it's just like a pit of gore, and you hand sculpted all these really badass spines and, and bony protrusions on the board itself. Uh, but it complements your army so, so well. And it just was clear to me from the onset that you had like this really powerful vision for it. Um, and I think that's what attracted me to the army right off the bat. So I guess, you know, you mentioned like reading the books and seeing the artwork and realizing that the models didn't exist. So was that kind of it? Was that where the Genesis came from is trying to fill in the blanks and, you know, try to imagine what the rest of the units could look like? Because one thing I guess we haven't really said is every every model on there on the board for the armies on parade board is basically a counts as version of something else in the Dark Elder Codex. Um yeah. So everything from, you know, the Talos paint engine to, I don't know, the, the Reaver jet bikes, et cetera, it's all converted to be part of a, a really twisted homunculus coven. So maybe you could just talk about that a little bit and, and explain, Sure. you know, just some of the, some of the basics of how you came up with all this crazy stuff. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I, I'm trying to figure it out because I know that it, it started with, Hey, I'm going to make some, a coven. And hey, I'm going to make some racks. I'm going to make some um, grotesques. And ho, oh, wouldn't it be cool if like these guys were riding around on a raider that wasn't just a normal raider because this is a coven. So mm-hmm. let's make the guy who's driving the raider look kind of like a, a homunculus himself. And let's instead of having the raider powering itself, let's slap like kind of a talos on the front of it. I think mm-hmm. yeah, a lot of it came out of the concept that Games Workshop came up with that the talos is a pain engine. Even back in third edition days, the model wasn't great, but they made this kind of scorpion look, flying scorpion looking thing Mm -hmm. that had a guy strapped into it. Yeah, sort of crucified inside it. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the rules even for the old Talos were that the the, like death throes of this body strapped into it were propelling this machine forward. So I think I just kind of went off on the idea of a pain engine and like, and, and pain as like a possible generator for a vehicle. So it started with that. Um, I think I have pictures of it on the site, even though I've, I've never actually finished it. I need to finish it. It's a, it's a Raider that has a, um, a Talos pilot kind of at the front. And um, it looks like he's grown into the Raider. Mm-hmm. And then from there, I think I just started thinking like, now that I've done, uh, now that I've done a homunculus version of a Raider, like what else could I do homunculus versions of? Um, and, yeah, I don't. I, I can't know. I don't know where it came from, but at a point, it just went crazy. Like at a point, I just decided that I was going to do homunculus versions of every model in the codex. I haven't gotten there yet, but that's my goal. So, well, um, I think. I mean, there's a point where it seemed like there was sort of a break where uh, I think the model that really drew me into the project the most was the the Chronos Parasite engine. Um, it again, it's really difficult to describe. You could probably do it better than I could, but. Basically, it looks nothing like the the official model per se. It's this nightmare creation that looks like something straight out of like a Guillermo del Toro movie or something. But he's got, you know, these faces sort of popping out different parts of his body. And on his back, there's sort of like a pool of, of blood with his spine that arches over it like a crane. I mean, it's just incredible. Like that, I think for me is like, OK, I'm not trying to replicate something. I'm coming up with something totally different. You know, like, what's the thought process behind coming up with something like that, as opposed to, like, what you did with the Raider, which is, let's see how we can convert a Raider to fit within the Coven. And that Kronos Parasite engine and his little buddies were, like, fundamentally different. But they still blend in. That one, I actually have a decent story for. Um, I can remember exactly where that one came from. Um, when Games Workshop released kind of the the Coven wave... Um, there were the racks and the grotesques. Um, I will never love the grotesque model. I think that the grotesque model is the name for it is very fitting. Um, I don't like shitting on Dark Eldar and Dark Eldar designs because I am a huge lover of Jess Goodwin. I've yeah. met Jess. <laughs> yeah, Jess um, is amazing. I, like I've I've seen Dark Eldar concepts before they were actually models, and <clears throat> he's he's a phenomenal artist, and I love everything he does. But when that rack or when the um, the homunculus coven wave came out, it was the Talos, the plastic Talos, which is amazing. And then the um, 
fine cast grotesques, which look like breakdancing big fit. And then <laughs> the racks, which were okay models, but they were just so like, they, they very much look like Frankenstein creations. Like they look like line after line of these guys walking with their arms at their sides. Well, actually you mentioned Jess real quick. Let me just kind of, on. have you watched any of the Warhammer live stuff? No, I need to get on that. They interviewed him uh, a couple of weeks ago. You have to subscribe to watch the older videos, but uh, it's really actually a great interview. And in it, he mentioned kind of as an aside that he really had intended to do many more of those models. But for some reason, like only a couple of the designs even made it out. And that's why they all look the same. He's like, I have plans to do a whole series of them. It just never happened. So anyway, I thought that was kind of interesting because I read that on your blog too, that, you know, you were not impressed with the sameness of them. But that's that's why. <laughs> uh yeah, no, I I haven't. This is the Twitch stuff you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, Warhammer Live on Twitch. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I haven't gotten into that, but I've been meaning to because I I heard that they interviewed Jess. Um, yeah, when the the Talos came out, like I was really impressed with the Talos, and I feel <laughs> kind of like a bit of a shit because I love Jess, I love his models, but every time he makes something, I need to convert it. <laughs> like I don't think I have ever built a plastic Carnifex straight out of the box. Right. <laughs> Um, I'm in love with the plastic Carnifex. I actually, I converted my first big Carnifex conversion was an exo yeah, grind. Yeah. I saw and that. it was, I don't know if we're supposed to talk about this, but whatever, it's been enough years. Um, I did it as a, a team project with high fleet Malak and we entered it in the golden demon in Germany. And we actually won a, a bronze golden demon for it. Oh, badass! Like you're not, you're not allowed to do that. You're not supposed to work on things together. Um, although wait, oh. I think Germany had a, <laughs> I think Germany had a weird rule because I remember we, we said that we had worked on it together. Anyway, it was the only golden demon I've ever won. And, um, I actually had the chance to meet Jess that time because back in the day, um, High Fleet Malak was really close with Jess and with the studio. And he actually got Tiernid bottles before the Tiernid bottles came out and he converted oh, a wow. whole, I don't know if you ever remember seeing it, but it was like a Godzilla army whole bunch of black and red carnifexes and hive tyrants. That sounds vaguely familiar, but I didn't follow a lot of the Tyranid stuff back then. Yeah, so it was featured in White Dwarf, and he had a really good relationship. So when we were at Games Day this one time, we actually got to hang out with Phil and Jess. Like, this was very oh, wow. recently after the Tyranid Codex had come out. And I got Jess to autograph the bottom of my Golden Demon. Oh, that's so cool. Like, why, why do you want me to autograph this? I'm like, dude, you made the model that I converted to to win this he's like okay crazy man here you go <laughs> but um sorry that's a complete aside i love everything jess goodwin has done I, but i don't think i've ever made one of his models straight out of the box i think i always convert them um and it makes me feel bad but the talos is one of my most converted models um i love the talos one day i'm going to build a talos straight just like out of dedication to jess being a phenomenal artist right <laughs> but what i saw when the talos came out sorry this is a very roundabout answer to this question that's no, all good um but when the Talos came out, I was sold on the Talos design. I'm like, yes, this is what a Talos looks like. This is perfect. We got like the crazy arms. We got the crazy head. This is what a Talos is supposed to look like. But then they were like, oh, and there's this other thing called the Kronos Parasite Engine. It's this soul-socking creature that devours your souls and uses them as energy and then uses them to power its weapons. And then it's like, okay, but what does it look like? It's like, oh, well. It's a Talos, <laughs> but it's got some tentacles on it. Right. And it's got and this like, big disc thing. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's got a, it's got a, a sucker. It's got a, like a, like a, a sucker that you'd see on a mosquito. Right. That's right. Yeah. It had like a proboscis, didn't it? Yeah. yeah. So the way that, I think the way that my Kronos Parasite engine came about um, is that I looked at the Talos and I said, this is not a soul parasite. This is not terrifying. Um, so I took, I took the exact, the actual model. Um, it's that model is about 70% or 60% Talos. It's just that I got a whole, like basically all the tentacles that you could possibly find in the kit, um, that come for the Kronos. And I put them all as the things kind of tail. So it looks kind of like an octopus. Yeah. And then I used it's the, like all the biological parts of the kits, but none of the mechanical parts. So I, built these kind of like large grasping hands and I have this huge mouth that's kind of like sucking in souls. And the thing you're referring to on the back with all the faces in it, mm -hmm. and it has the kind of like crane looking thing arching up over it. That one is officially referred to as the punch bowl of souls. Because <laughs> if you look at it from the back, 
it's got the pattern of the Kronos's like disc siphon. Yeah, it does. Siphon or whatever it's called. Yeah. Inlaid in it. And then all the, the souls that it's sucked in are these faces that are kind of like churning around that design. Yeah. Um, and it just came from this idea where I looked at the Talos and I was like, what would this look like if it was an actual spirit sucker? And I'm like, okay, well, it would have this huge hungry mouth that's like trying to suck souls. And then, well, what if it had like a, a mouth on its hand? And what if it had a mouth on its other hand? What if it, there was like all these mouths all over it that were just like hungrily trying to devour souls. Um, and I even had this concept of doing a, a victim model on the base that's having his spirit sucked out, but someone told me it would be too much and it would distract from the model. I think they were um, probably right, but I mean, you almost get that just from looking at the thing. Like all of that well, is cool. communicated it so well. Comes across. Yeah. Yeah. And then it's that I think might have been the place where my obsession with converting all the models from the codex came about. Because when I started thinking about that, that was like a Kronos parasite and it like kind of exists in our world and kind of doesn't and it feeds on souls. And then I was looking at the other models in the codex and thinking about how I could convert these to be represented um, with more homunculus style units. Mm -hmm. And one that jumped out me at me was the mandrakes. Yes. And that was another. Sorry. Oh no, I was just agreeing because they obviously tie into the the parasite engine. Yeah, well, they wouldn't if you just go and look at the fluff. But I, I found a way to tie them in because the mandrake models are pretty cool, but. In the fluff, it talks about these things emerging from people's shadows and creeping up on you. And I was like, okay. And I'd actually spoken to Jess about the concepts for the Mandrakes because I, I spoke to him kind of like after he'd released some of the new tier, the, the Dark Eldar models, but not all of them. And he was telling me about how his concept for the Mandrakes was informed heavily by um, Japanese myth and Japanese demons. Well, yeah, they're wearing Hakama, like they're, you know, out yeah. of flayed skin, but yeah. Yeah, and like the kind of idea i can't remember is it is it the ring the one with the the girl with the crazy hair in her face and it's really scary oh yeah the ring yeah 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 mm -hmm. yeah so very he said he was like very much influenced by that and kind of like japanese demon myths so they came out that perfectly but yeah they for did. me when i looked at the fluff and they talked about these things emerging from your shadows i'm like no these need to be like nightmares like these need to be like walking talking nightmares so i kind of took the the design i had for the chronos parasite engine which is this tentacled thing with arms and this giant gaping mouth and i kind of shrunk that down to sort of a mandrake size model mm -hmm. and same thing with like kind of like all these tentacles coming off them and these like long grasping hands and these giant gaping mouths um that were looking to suck your soul and like in all of them i kind of carried over um when i was doing the chronos and i took that part on the back that is the the spirit siphon that kind of pattern mm -hmm. looks like runes or something um, I carry that over to other parts of the model so that it looked like it was kind of animated by these these runes, and then I um, sculpted those onto the the like smaller Chronos parasites as well that were going to stand in for mandrakes. Which is an and, awesome visual tie-in. Yeah, it really does. It brings them together so well. And like it's it's like when I have an idea and I have a concept for an army, it kind of goes crazy. So I have there's a whole extension of that line that a whole side of my homunculus coven is based on kind of a, a kind of flesh craft or homunculus craft that is based on the kind of stuff around the Kronos parasite engine. Mm -hmm. So the whole like, like weird kind of demon things, they feed off souls. Um, I've extended that into, so we've got the Kronos parasite engine. We've got the mandrakes. I have a concept for scourges that instead of flying around on wings, they're like dark Eldar warriors that are basically this mandrake Kronos parasite thing that lets them phase in and out of reality. Oh, so think of them as cool. kind of dark Eldar wolf spiders. Yeah. And they're literally, they're just scourge models, but they have like mini maws with like tentacles coming off them, like trapped in these fields on their back. And just like I did with one of my mandrake models where I have it kind of like phasing out of the ground, I want to have my, Scourge models like phasing in and out of terrain. That's such a cool idea. Um, and then from that, I want to transfer it even down to the Beastmaster, um, where there's like the razor wing flocks, the weird birds that fly around with them for some reason. Yep. I want to, instead of having birds, I want to have these juvenile Kronos parasites where it'll be like a base of these tentacled maws that are just kind of like flying around and trying to eat people. Okay, unfortunately, I need to stop the interview somewhere so we can keep these episodes around a half hour. So this seems like as good a spot as any. 
Uh, we will continue right from where this one leaves off. So if you're listening to this after all of the pieces have been recorded and released, uh, you can go ahead and move on to the next one. Otherwise, you'll have to wait a week. I apologize, but that's just the way the world is. Uh, I'm going to skip a lot of my formal outro stuff, but I would like to mention that uh, the show is still new. This is our first interview, and I know there are some recording issues, uh, some sound quality issues that, well, let's just say I learned a lot from it. (laughs) But if you have any suggestions or feedback, uh, do feel free to drop a comment on chapterapproved.com. Each episode has an individual comment section. Uh, You can also reach me directly on Twitter at Chapter Approved. And on Facebook, if you just search for Chapter Approved, you should find me there as well. Otherwise, you can always shoot me an email. Tibbs at ChapterApproved.com works. So whichever way you feel like reaching out to me is fine. You can also leave comments and or reviews on iTunes or Stitcher or Google Play Radio or any of the, the sources that you listen to this podcast. I hope you enjoyed the first part of this interview, and there's a lot more where that came from. So tune in next week for the next episode, and we'll just keep moving right along.